We are I. I sit here this morning and with a smile on my face, looking at this poster that I have. It's framed and it's sitting on the wall amongst all the other beautiful things that I have on my wall that remind me of the things that I love so much and that I do all the things I do for every day. But this one really speaks to my soul and who I am as a person. And I love that it's there. And I never want to I never want to forget these very important seven words. Not all those who wander are lost. Just let that sit and marinate with you for a bit. Not all those who wander are lost. And this comes by way of the wanderlust. And I look at what this wanderlust has given me throughout my entire life. How many stories that I've forgot that, you know, sit in the back of my mind, you know, whether or not these stories are good or bad. You know, I remember this one time when I was young, it's probably close to my oldest daughter's age now. You know, I was probably 11, 12 years old, maybe 13 at the max. And I go up into... South Castle with my dad and his buddies, you know, up to our wall tent that they set up every hunting season in the fall, something that they've done. It's a ritual for them to go elk hunting in the Rocky Mountains. You know, and I, I didn't realize how special this was until I was an adult realizing that people spend tens of thousands of dollars, you know, like 30, 40, $50,000 to come from around the world to do what we did. And this was just something that we did as farmers. You know, we trek 20, 30 miles and horses or quads into the back country, into South Castle. We put up a 20 by 30 wall tent. You know, we break bales and put them out and, you know, get some medium size, you know, logs to be able to frame in this bed, throw a tarp over the, the broken up bales roll the logs onto the edges of that so the tarp didn't move, throw all the sleeping bags on top of that with a pillow. Then having this, you know, cold box in the back, you know, into the back corner of the tent to try to keep the, you know, some of the items as cool as possible, but, you know, also to keep the the rodents away from getting to your food. So you have this nice little plywood lock box, stood up like a refrigerator. They even painted it white. (laughs) It's so funny. You know, then you have this picnic table that was our proxy dinner table slash couch slash lounger slash bar slash, you know, cooktop, cutting board, the whole bit. And this 50 gallon oil drum, you know, from one of the farms that was modified into a, you know, a fire pit or fireplace you know, laying down on its side with some legs built with a with a door cut in the middle with a stove pipe that goes out the top, you know, that would get glowing red. You know, and that's what would provide heat, that would boil water for coffee, that would, you know, prepare all the food that was a life source. You know, we lived in this tent for, you know, up to a month at a time. You know, and I look at that experience alone, that that soul experience, where we were, how far we went back, to be able to take horses in or quads in for 20 miles into the back country to stay in this wall tent that is now deemed to be clamping. Like that alone, you know, would be like a thousand dollars a night, if not more out here in BC. And just looking at that, and that was how I grew up. But never mind that, you know, from there, like that was just the start. That was just your home base. Like you just went, there's a, a place to be able to survive, but you're, you're there eating, you know, fresh elk meat, fresh deer meat from these places that are so far back into the wild. 
you know, that a lot of these, these animals have never seen a human before. You know, and then one time, one early morning, you know, my dad and I, we, we get up and we trek across this, this little creek. You know, the snow is, you know, over knee deep for me. This is for whatever perverse reason at a time when my dad clearly didn't believe in snowshoes when snowshoes would have made a world of difference. You're trekking into the backcountry where there's never been a person who's walked except for where you're walking, you know, in snow that's fresh and deep. And this man doesn't think that snowshoes are the way to go, whether they're at that time more inconvenient or, you know, just a real man doesn't use them or anything along those lines. We just didn't have them. You know, and we're trekking into the back and I got my snow pants on, my boots and my gloves. And like, we're just, we're walking and walking and walking forever. And we're going down this, this trail and the snow starts to come. And, you know, it's not, not a white out, but you know, like there's enough of a breeze coming at us and the snow is heavy enough that it's winter, like real winter in Southern Alberta in the Rocky Mountains and like no joke. And then my dad looks down and he's like, son, look at this. So I look down and it doesn't seem to be anything extraordinary to me. You know, but my dad says, he's like, these are cougar prints. These are fresh. Like he's like, think about it. It's snowing right now. And you can see how perfectly outlined these paw pads are, you know, in these prints. He's like, you know, these were just seconds old. So I was like, hmm. don't really know what the risk of that may be as a, as a young man of my age, but I'm sure my dad was fully aware of like, holy fuck, there's a cougar like right here. You know, and so we keep on walking down this, this path, which was an old decommissioned logging road. And also my dad's like, stop. He's like, look, look up. And there's this cougar probably 20, 30 yards in front of us. And there's enough of a wind that the noise that we were making, that this cat didn't pick it up, nor our scent. But I will never forget what it looks like to see a cougar in the Rocky Mountains in Southern Alberta, in the snow, looking like one of the most majestic animals, but is in full prowl. This animal was in full prowl, locked in on its target, whatever it was going to try and kill, was so locked in on this animal, hunting this animal. And if you look at the the interesting complexity behind this that we are also stalking animals while this cougar is stalking animals and we're both just trying to survive. But we get to watch this expert, one of the most utmost experts on the planet for efficiency of stalking and retrieving its kill. And it just goes across this path and we sit there and we watch it and you know, it's, as wide as a standard row, which may be what, 15 feet, 20 feet. But there's this little bit of a clearing on the other side of the road and you just see this cat, you know, it can freeze mid-step, holding its paw in the air because it sees that that animal may have roughly got a, a hint that it's there. And it waits for that animal to calm down. It just takes another step. And another slow step and you see it stretching its body out. So it's really, really close to the ground. It's just very long and narrow. And you, know, you see this beautiful contrast between this goldish brown color amongst the perfect white background. with The long tail that's kind of curled on the end a little bit in stark interest and contrast. Just kind of up just a little subtle little bit of arc on this tail, but very long. I'll never forget the length of this animal. How it seemed impossible that it could be so close to the ground and yet move so graciously with such absolute control. I feel like this whole, this whole time, it was probably maybe 10 or 15 seconds, but it just felt like this perfect eternity to be able to watch this animal, you know, go by us. 
And once it goes and we're just left there, my dad says to me, he's like, son, he's like, you don't understand right now, but he's like, you will never see that again in your life. So I was like, in my mind, fair enough. And we keep on walking and I knew and know now how awestruck I was by the beauty and the majesty of this animal and this action. But I had no idea of like the actual significance of this until now, until these later years of my life, knowing that it is next to impossible to see a cougar in the backcountry, no matter how hard you try. That's why people hunt cougars with dogs, because it is almost impossible to hunt a cougar as a human being and be successful at that. Next to impossible. And not only that, that if you do happen to stumble across a cougar, even with a dog, let alone just as a human being that you're out there actually looking for a cougar and trying to find one. But the absolute sheer improbability of being able to watch a cougar in the wild, you know, in full prowl stalking an animal like that, the odds of that are like so impossible. It's like winning the lottery, literally. But on top of that, that it's winter time. You are so close that you can see the hairs on this animal individually. You can see perfectly where the hairs change color. You can see the whiskers on this animal. You can see the look in its eyes, how locked in it is on its prey. And how the probability now is like definitely like winning the lottery. But on top of that, you have all these factors, but now you are in the Rocky Mountains in Southern Alberta, one of the most beautiful places on planet Earth. World renowned. Knowing that people would have paid so much money just to be there, never mind to be in that exact experience. That's how you feel very fortunate, very fortunate. And what I feel is like the most fortunate part of this whole story is that not only was my dad the type of guy and his buddies were the type of guys who would go out and do this. And some of his buddies that he did this with then still do this now. You know, and these motherfuckers are in their late 60s, early 70s. But I'm so honored that my dad and so privileged that my dad did this, but not only to the fact, but he also took me and bestowed upon me the memories and the responsibilities of making this important for myself, but also important for my family as well. Realizing that they're hard memories to understand how beautiful they're going to be until you get a little bit older when you can actually really appreciate with the gifts that were given to you, when at the time they didn't feel like gifts at all, which was walking in waist deep snow, knee deep snow as a young child, but having those memories to be able to leverage and look back upon now are some of the best memories that I have in my entire life. So happy Friday. The question of the day is, what memories do you have looking back at your childhood that you're honored to be able to tell those stories now as an adult. 